we start the recording of the meeting? Yeah, the recording started. We might continue. The recording's on, yeah. Okay, so the recording and YouTube's on. Chairperson, we live. We might continue. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us in the Budget Committee today. Today is another auspicious day in the Budget Committee. Following the national tabling of the Adjustment Budget, the province, through Minister David Mania, has today, this afternoon, in the sitting, tabled the Adjustment Budget for the Western Cape. And it has accordingly been referred to the Budget Committee. Members, just some housekeeping. I'm going to ask that you all just mute yourself and put your video off unless you are on the floor speaking. And also when you are done speaking, just to also put your video and mic off afterwards as well. Similarly, if you have a point of order or would like to ask a question, there's a raise hand function. You can also type in the chat box and I also then request that once you have asked your question that you please lower your hand. Um, members of the public will be watching us on YouTube. So this is live and I've received confirmation that um, it is being recorded and I would like to welcome members. I would like to welcome the Minister and the Provincial Treasury to today's meeting and I've received one apology from Honourable Mitchell. So today in, we're going to be getting a briefing from Provincial Treasury on today's bill, the Western Cape Adjustments Appropriation COVID-19 Bill 2020-2021 Financial Year B4 2020. Members, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first ask that you introduce yourselves and then I'm going to just ask for the Minister and the HOD to introduce themselves. And instead of introducing every single person from the department, I'm just going to then ask that if you are speaking from the department um, in the presentation, that you just please introduce yourself before you speak. Okay. Members, um, you may introduce yourselves. Good afternoon, uh, Ricardo McKenzie. Uh, Thank you, Honorable Mula McKenzie. Nulama Mvimbi. Thank you, Honorable Mvimbi. Good afternoon, Chairperson, Wendy Philander. Thank you, Honorable Philander. Good afternoon, Chairperson, uh, Gillian Bosman. Thank you and welcome, Honorable Bosman. Good afternoon, Chair Good afternoon. Regan Allen. Thank you, Honorable Allen. Good afternoon, Mireille Wenger. Thank you. I heard Honourable Lacker and Honourable Winger at the same time there. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair, the Honourable Moran. Thank you, Honourable Moran. Hi, good evening, Chair, Honourable Syed. Evening, Honourable Syed. I think... Honourable Bocha, can you hear me? Honourable Makamba Bocha, I see you on the side participants, but I'm not sure if um, you are with us in terms of hearing and so on. Can you hear me? Honourable Makamba Bocha? Okay, perhaps she has connectivity problems. Okay, members, uh, Minister and HOD, over to you, and then you can jump right into the presentation. And please excuse me while I put my video off. I just don't want to have um, connectivity problems, but I will put it on if I'm speaking. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. My name is David Mania. I'm the Minister of Finance and Economic Opportunities. I'm joined by uh, David Savage, Head Official of Provincial Treasury, uh, together with uh, Team uh, Finance. I assume from your instruction that you do not want me to introduce uh, the team and you would like me to uh, jump right into making introductory comments and then handing over to the department for the detailed presentation. Is that correct? Yes, please. If there's anyone else, they can introduce themselves before they speak. I just don't want a 20, 30 persons in the department introducing themselves and us losing time. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Chairperson. I think that's uh, understood. I would like to make just some very brief uh, introductory remarks, perhaps for members of the public uh, who may not have been able to join us this afternoon uh, in Parliament. And I will then hand over to uh, David Savage, uh, Head Official of Provincial Treasury, together with Team Finance for the, the detailed briefing. Uh, Chairperson, obviously, uh, as you and all the honourable members will be aware, uh, we tabled uh, our adjustments budget, uh, which we entitled a budget to beat COVID-19 uh, in the Western Cape. I think an important point uh, is uh, to emphasise that, of course, this is uh, an adjustments budget, which is part of a three-phase budget uh, process uh, designed to reprioritize expenditure over time. Starting in phase one, obviously, with this special adjustments budget, uh, then shifting uh, to uh, identifying deeper savings uh, from reprioritization uh, ahead of the next adjustments budget, which of course is the medium term budget policy statement uh, uh, later this year. And then finally, uh, in the lead up to uh, main budget uh, 2021, uh, again, focusing on even deeper, uh, realizing deeper savings. So I think the first point is uh, this adjustments budget is the first in a three-phase budget process uh, designed to reprioritize expenditure over time, and the department will uh, speak to this point in detail. We obviously this afternoon have uh, mobilized funding uh, for the immediate response uh, to, to, to COVID-19. We've mobilized uh, 3.05 billion rand, uh, which has been allocated principally 1.8 million to the Department of Health, 400 million to the Department of Transport and Public Works, 310 million to the Department of Education, and of course, 84 million to various departments for humanitarian relief. Uh, we funded the, 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 the budget principally by uh, committing 1.4 billion rand from provincial reserves, uh, committing just more than a billion rand from savings realized as a result of baseline reductions, uh, as well as committing, of course, uh, 605.5 million rand in national grants and uh, 27.2 million rand in rollover and retentions, which gives us a net upward adjustment of about 1.1 uh, billion rand. And it's in this way, Chairperson and Honourable Members, that we have been able to support the immediate health response, the immediate humanitarian uh, response, and the immediate economic response to COVID-19 uh, in the Western Cape. Chairperson, uh, with those very brief introductory remarks, I'd like to hand over through you uh, to David Savage, Head Official of Provincial Treasury and Team Finance for the detailed briefing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairperson, and thank you, thank you, Minister. Um, yes, as uh, the Minister said, I'm uh, David Savage, the HOD of the Provincial Treasury. I'm joined by a solid team of uh, Treasury officials uh, who've all been working very hard on this um, on this budget. We are going to uh, go, we have obviously tabled a very extensive an unusually extensive um, uh, uh, set of budget documents for an adjustments budget. Uh, and that's been intentional because we are in um, exceptionally unusual usual times. We are going to uh, do a joint presentation where my colleagues will run through various aspects of the um, uh, uh, of the budget documents. Um, but I will I will guide you through it, and I'll introduce uh, colleagues as they uh, come online to um, to deal with specific uh, the specific matters uh, that they've been uh, working there and their teams have been working on. I think that uh, the first point that is essential to note is that there have now already almost from the the as the minister said the day after tabling of the budget there have uh, of the main budget the extensive uh, disruptions uh, to the current financial year began. We're dealing with uh, an unprecedented national disaster. It's called for uh, us as the provincial treasury and the provincial government as a whole to immediately refocus resources right across our mandates into our frontline public health response. 
while at the same time being aware uh, and having to learn much more about on an ongoing uh, um, basis uh, the economic and fiscal impacts of uh, the national disaster that remains evolving and very uncertain as does the pandemic. I think simultaneously and what has been uh, very unusual for us as a provincial treasury is uh, and for the government as a whole is we've had to rapidly move many of our operations off-site with movement constraints and quite honestly quite extensive staff uh, overload uh, in terms of trying to ad adapt our systems. We've done this. Uh, this budget process has technically been accomplished in an, uh, in an entirely online environment, which is a which is a first. It's clear that these disruptions are going to have lasting implications on on key reporting, auditing, and budget timelines through the rest of this financial year. On the financial uh, and auditing and reporting timelines, uh, there have been uh, uh, notifications from national government on uh, revised dates for the for those processes. The commencement of the uh, 1920 audit process was delayed to June. Uh, the submission of AFSs to the AG has been delayed to the end of July. Uh, financial reporting on the 1920 pre-audit outcomes uh, to early August uh, and the tabling of annual reports and AFSs to November. These are significant, unusual uh, disruptions that all votes uh, are having to accommodate at the moment, and they obviously have knock-on effects to uh, the provincial treasury uh, and others uh, in the oversight uh, process. On the budget process side, we've taken the unusual step uh, that we'll talk to in a little bit more detail of introducing a significant and early adjustment to our budget that the Minister had tabled in the Legislature today. We are anticipating a further adjustments budget in November when we would conventionally adjust our budget alongside the tabling of the, uh, the medium-term uh, budget policy statement and our um, uh, provincial and municipal economic reviews and outlooks, uh, which we uh, uh, typically table in uh, September, are going to have to be delayed to October as we as we um, reposition those documents to be able to respond to this completely unique circumstance. My colleague, uh, my colleagues are going to take us through a revised view on the economic and fiscal outlook. Uh, in, in the first instance, secondly, a look at the budget process and the adjustments uh, that, that led us to these, these adjustments and some of the key themes that have emerged out of them. Uh, second, uh, thirdly, the adjustments process itself. And then finally, uh, I will end up with, uh, with DDG Jolinda Gantana uh, in just summarizing some of the pressures going forward and some of the complementary budget measures uh, that we are taking to make sure that uh, the, the, the <coughs> financial management of the provincial government may, remains on a sound uh, footing uh, in in, uh, in the um, uh, in the weeks and months uh, that are ahead of us. So let me start by then uh, introducing uh, acting DDG Anthony Phillips, who will talk to the economic and fiscal context that we find ourselves in. Good evening, Chairperson and members. The client, okay. So just maybe an update actually with regard to the economic environment and highlighting basically that the IMF forecast actually that global growth will contract by 4.9%. This is by 1.9% worse off than what was previously uh, forecasted. Looking at this at the advanced economies, you would find actually that the advanced economies are expected to uh, grow at minus 8% in 2020, while the emerging and developing countries actually will grow at minus 3%. The South African economy, however, has contracted consecutively for the third quarter, which means we're in a deep recession. And you're looking at, for example, 2% decline in GDP, actually, if we go year on year, quarter by quarter one to quarter one, actually, um, um, comparisons. The South African economy is expected to grow at minus 8%. Uh, this is according to the World Bank, uh, um, the IMF in, in June 2020, however, the South African Reserve Bank actually today actually brought out its figures actually that says the South African economy will uh, grow by minus 7.3 percent, which is marginally lower than what was uh, better than what was presented actually actually in in in, in June 2020 by the IMF. 
I mean, the, the, this particular dismal growth actually uh, internationally or globally actually is actually as a result of the measures taken by developed countries, particularly around the, glo uh, the COVID um, pandemic. However, in South Africa, maybe the distinction is actually our economy was struggling actually even prior to, to COVID-19. And some of them actually is driven by structural economic constraints such as energy shortages. So looking at, at just economic forecast, actually, we're seeing actually that, you know, that you're looking at the largest economic decline in almost 90 years. Putting this into context, actually, the deteriorating economic environment actually requires a long to medium term approach and particularly a fiscal response, actually, that's required actually to, to, to deal with the pandemic going forward. On the Western Cape side, actually, and we're looking just at this particular graph, actually, we're saying actually we're looking at an elong elongated U-shaped recovery if there is no interventions actually taken to actually do revive the, e the economy. We are estimating the Western Cape GVA to contract by 10.2%, and we're looking at job losses of 167,000 jobs, actually, uh, roughly. The main sectors actually that are affected by this is tourism, um, informal sector, as well as the construction, where the tourism sector is actually supposed to look at declining actually on this GVA by 57.4%, or at least seven, almost 71,000 job losses. Informal sectors, about 27 job 27,000 job losses, while ever the construction looking at about 18 or 19,000 actually job losses. The wine industry, however, due to export disruptions, are expected to have a lower revenue of about 1 billion, and there's quite a, a, a quite a big risk actually of losing jobs actually, but to the tune of about 18,000 jobs in in that particular industry. The BER actually highlights actually that our business confidence index actually has taken a, a further blow actually from 8% uh, down to 8% actually even though in quarter two, even though in quarter one actually we actually looked at actually having a business confidence index of 22 points um, in 2020. So from just from the fiscal outlook actually given that economic environment actually we're saying look the gross revenue is down and been revised down nationally from 1.43 trillion to 1.12 um, trillion. We're also looking at the collections actually for the first two months actually in 2021 to be 142 billion actually, which is actually lower than what was forecasted in February to, to be 177 billion, which means actually that we at this point in time actually our revenue is actually almost lagging by almost 35 billion. Our projected budget deficit actually we actually estimated as at this point in time to be 761 billion or 15.7% of GDP, and this has been revised actually from the 317 billion to or 6.8 percent of GDP in February. So you can see actually that there's been major shifts actually between February and what we are seeing now. The gross national debt, however, is close to 4 trillion or 81 percent, 81.8 percent of GDP, um, um, and that also has been revised actually from the 3.56 trillion actually or 66 that was actually uh, put in the budget actually in in February. So therefore, actually looking at, at the situation with regard to debt, we can see actually the debt service cost actually is crowding out other expenditures, particularly in the service delivery environment. And all of these things actually just means actually that we will have lower or uh, uh, less money actually uh, to be spent within government programs, particularly around expenditure reductions of about 300, 230 billion less over the medium terms. And there's also some implications with regard to additional tax measures. As mentioned by the minister, as well as the national minister, with regard to this crocodile mouth, basically, that we're looking at, the two uh, um, figures here that are showing there just highlights actually that's what's happening with regard to both the revenue and expenditure on the one, and the other one actually looking at the debt to GDP, basically, where you have a widening of the mouth of this particular hippopotamus, as, as, as was, was said. So all efforts will actually have to be looking at actually consolidating that particular picture. Thanks. Maybe I'll hand over to Sterren. Thank you, Tony. Um, uh, Chairperson, we would like uh, uh, Ms. Taryn van der Reeder, uh, who heads the Provincial Budget Office, uh, will now take us through what we've done in this revised 2020 budget uh, process. No problem. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chairperson and members. So based on the constrained economic and fiscal environment, as well as the impact of COVID-19, the Western Cape government revised its budget approach in May 2020 to ensure early response to risks. This budget approach is divided into three phases, which are all three connected and also takes a whole of government approach. 
So starting off with the immediate phase, this phase focuses on reprioritization of spending towards COVID-19, but also includes immediate savings and cost containment. And the outcome essentially of this phase will input into the first 2020 adjusted budget, which was tabled today. Then moving on to the short term phase, this focuses on policy led reprioritization and will also be based on the updated provincial strategic plan. The outcome of this phase will input into the second adjusted budget, which will be tabled in November. Then lastly, we have the medium term phase, which focuses on streamlining governance arrangements, and this will be led by the Department of the Premier. The outcome of this phase will input into the 2021 budget. But the key um, point to make really with this slide is that if we are taking this medium term approach, we really need to focus on and capitalize on the immediate phase and the short term phase if we want to position the Western Cape government beyond the 2020 budget process and toward recovery. Next slide. So as part of phase one of the 2020 budget process, we had a number of technical budget engagements with all of the Western Cape government departments. Through these engagements, we identified a number of key risks and opportunities. Um, I will just touch on a few of them. From the risk side, we have the prolonged peak in COVID-19 infections, which impacts planning over the, over the medium to long term. In terms of this, there's also the risk of the second wave of infections. Secondly is the deep lasting economic and fiscal constraints, which really speaks to the requirement of this medium term approach. Then we have the national policy uncertainty, and this links largely to the education sector. We then have lost momentum in service delivery, but this is also speaking to the issue around loss in terms of gains made and relates to infrastructure construction and maintenance delays, as well as social crime prevention programs not implemented due to the lockdown but also speaks to loss in terms of gains made with regards to the health sector. Then we have reduced ability to respond to persistent pressure from non-COVID risks such as climate change, and these types of risks may result in further disaster responses required down the line. We then have municipal challenges, which includes liquidity, increased vulnerability for fraud, corruption, and maladministration. And this also informs some of the work that will be done by the provincial treasury and the department of local government going forward. Lastly, in terms of the risks, we have changing work environment for staff, particularly COVID-19 frontline staff. And this has resulted in increased levels of anxiety and fears. When shifting to the right, um, in terms of the opportunities, firstly, we are promoting social cohesion and holistic well-being through taking a whole of society approach. And by holistic well-being, I mean social, mental, and emotional well-being. Then we have integrated public health strategies, and this is for greater impact, linking violence prevention measures with alcohol-based harms reduction strategies to respond to GBV. And this also links to our priority um, in terms of safety for the province, protecting productive infrastructure investment programs and developing a higher quality infrastructure pipeline and this is about identifying bankable infrastructure projects and then also reimagining provincial governance, which includes removing transactional inefficiencies, unlocking innovation and building a capable local government. And this also links to uh, my previous point on addressing the municipal challenges. And then lastly, it's about leveraging technology and data platforms. And as part of this, it's also about bridging the digital divide. But the key point also here to make is that these key risks and opportunities will also be taken into account as part of phase two and phase three of this budget process. Um, thank you, Chairperson and members. Thank you. Thank you, Taryn. The uh, Chairperson, uh, Honourable Members, the, uh, the, we are about to present, uh, you, you know, the numbers associated with the budget and it, it, it can get uh, very uh, confusing uh, because it's, uh, you know, a large number of tables. We've tried our best to uh, make this as, uh, as easy to understand and transparent um, as, as possible. Uh, every number, as you know, in the provincial treasury has got a logic behind it um, and it's it's been painstakingly constructed. The, um, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Annalise, Annalise Pick, um, who heads our provincial government finance team, uh, to take us through this, uh, this section of the presentation. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Savage. And for the numbers sake, 
assume we understand what the numbers are for unless stated otherwise in our questions and answers. Thank you. Good evening, Chairperson. Good evening, members of the Budget Committee. Yes, the, this adjustments estimate um, is it has not been a very uh, has been an easy adjusted estimate. It is been uh, a context in terms of a very uncertain environment. It's been a context in terms of a very fluid environment. Um, but overall, in terms of what I'm going to be presenting to you, starting off with firstly in terms of the decision making and the principles around the allocations around this adjustments estimate, and then I will give you in terms of the the actual allocations that we are making. So some of the decision making and the underlying principles of this adjustments budget is to indicate firstly, it is a first of three phase review of our entire 2020 budget. Also that this adjustments estimate is limited to our provincial response to COVID-19 and that all other, uh, other adjustments to uh, departments budgets will be done as part of the second phase, which will be the um, uh, accommodate in the second adjustments budget in November. Then in terms of the actual uh, actual allocations, what we took into account um, regarding additional funding is number one, trying to maximize our uh, delivery as well as in, in, especially in terms of the disaster, in terms of our response, our priority responses. And then also in terms of uh, to maximize our, uh, our, our frontline services that they are um, able to respond. We also looked at additional funding regarding credible spending to ensure that departments and we as a government are spending in terms of our functional mandate. And we looked at credible forecasts going forward, as well as making sure that we have the capacity to spend um, and therefore we are having the rapid um, uh, deployment of our resources. Further in the next slide, we're looking at in the in the next slide, it's indicating to you um, what all the votes um, were taken into account when we looked at all the votes um, as part of the review for this part of the adjustments budget. So firstly, we looked at in terms of the impact of COVID-19 as the pandemic on um, all our departments. And we identified savings, cost containment, um, and delayed in spending um, across all departments. And th that is indicated in this budget as reductions to their baselines. This then afforded us the fiscal room that we created within this adjustments budget, then in order to respond and to finance some of the COVID-19 expenditure. Regarding the national conditional grants, we have our conditional grants have been adjusted. Um, it is a net reduction on our grants. Um, there has been an increase in the in the health COVID component. Um, and then there also has been some changes at the sectoral le level regarding conditions um, in the conditional grant frameworks that in terms of widens the expenditure um, that uh, that departments can incur on be, um, in responding to COVID-19. Then in terms of uh, this adjustments, looking at specially policy priorities and our earmarks that we have indicated when we tabled the, bu the budget in March, we have then Thank also you. here made sure that when we are utilizing this um, in this adjustments budget and it was reprioritized, it is towards um, COVID-19 and that it's in line with its original purpose. Then further, any savings that was identified on any of the policy priorities that was based on a voluntary recommendation um, by votes. Regarding the, the underspending of the previous financial year regarding rollover and revenue retention, this was considered, but it's only where to cover COVID-19 requirements and pressures. Regarding our COE, now our COE is our, um, the largest spending item on our budget. It consists of about 54% of our budget. And so we looked at the COE budget again within uh, this adjustments budget, um, and we have identified some immediate savings and those immediate savings then reverted um, to back to the provincial revenue fund. There were, however, some departments that were offered the opportunity to utilize um, the COE budgets, and this is mainly frontline um, COVID-19 departments, such as the Department of Health, Social Development, and the Department of Local Government. Going forward, any future savings on, on the COE 
will um, will most likely re revert back to the provincial um, revenue fund unless obviously um, there is uh, other pressures um, facing within um, that vote. Then um, this adjustments estimate also then looks at public entities. Um, as my colleague um, Taren van der Riede indicated, that what we are doing is making sure that there's no stone that is unturned and that we are making sure that we are preparing in the first phase for the coming phases um, of this of this budget review. So in regarding public entities, we are making sure that the COE um, rules that are uh, faced by departments within this government, that those that same COE um, rules are also um, put on public entities. Then lastly, in terms of looking forward beyond this adjustments estimate, we also then made the recommendation that there should be a reduced contingency. So we need to have a minimum provision um, due to the uncertainty in our fiscal and our policy environment, but also in terms of that we're only in the fourth month of this um, financial year and that as a, 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 a um, province that is prone um, to more than one um, uh, disaster, because we're also sitting with a with a drought at the same time, um, that we feel that it's prudent to have a reduced contingency. Then in terms of the next slide, in terms of now looking forward, so I indicated to you what this adjustments is that takes account of, and then also we've highlighted through the risks that has been identified, what we still need to take account of as part of the second phase. One of that being the revenue collection or the potential under revenue collection by departments and public entities. Here we need a full impact and assessment of this as part of that second phase to ensure that there is sustainability going forward. Then in terms of the earmarked allocations, and I, as I indicated in this adjustments budget, it's on the margin, but the second phase will review all earmarked allocations as part of a policy led review process. Regarding our municipal transfers, again, this is on the margin in this adjustments estimate, but going forward, there will be a review of all municipal transfers, including our agents. <laughs> agents that they have. Regarding the uh, our infrastructure as part of the second phase, here we need to look at number one, protecting, but number two, enhancing a critical infrastructure pipeline going forward, um, especially in terms of in line um, with our overall, overall Western Cape um, recovery plan. <laughs> Lastly, in terms of our second adjustments estimate, we are also saying in terms of any further um, savings, as I indicated, or un underspending on our COE that will revert uh, to the uh, provincial revenue fund. So when we look at the numbers in terms of what was, what did we have to respond to? So what are the pressures regarding COVID-19? And I also need to indicate to you that these pressures, um, they were they based on in terms of uh, the evidence base, number one. Number two, um, that uh, the assumptions in the beginning of, of our COVID-19, um, our, uh, our first two months, they were extremely fluid. Um, that also that we have worked with the departments um, on the costing of, of COVID-19. And this then gives you an idea in terms of what we needed to respond to as at the 8th of July, the costing, that's what the costing represents. So it also gives you in terms of our, our kind of responses that we needed in the medical side, in terms of Q&I, and in terms of uh, additional beds and staffing is required. It indicates also that the education and our humanitarian relief in terms of our pressures, as well as ourselves as an internalized government, how we needed to respond to COVID-19, what kind, how that impacted our costs. The slide also indicates to you those pressures in terms of how they are um, on the different votes regarding the first one, the Department of Transport and Public Works. Then it indicates also to you that the total that's amounting to about 543 million, the costing um, of Department of Health, about 2.3 billion then, Education Department, 1.3 billion, the Department of Social Development, 78 million, and then uh, the Department of Local Government, 23 million with uh, the Department of the Premier rounding up um, around about 80 million rand, which makes up the 4.4 billion rand patients that we need to respond to. So how does this adjustments budget then respond to that 4.4 billion rand? So in total, we are responding um, by allocating a total of three, just over three billion rand, as the minister indicated in his speech, 
and um, our in, and I need to indicate that this is our initial response um, as part of the principles of this adjustments budget. And so the first column in the slide actually in the, in, gives you an indication in terms of our priorities that we responded to. And then also this, the, the, the rest of the columns indicates how those priorities were funded. So where does the funding come from? So firstly, um, when we look at the 1,8 billion rand, that is in terms of the health, the health response. So our medical response um, for COVID-19 initially. Um, then in terms of quarantine and isolation, which is part of the broader health strategy um, as a response to COVID-19 for our province, 400 million rand allocation, our humanitarian relief totals um, just under 85 million rand. The education sector right now, what this adjustments budget makes allowance for is 310 million rand. And indicating right now that in terms of this is an initial response to the education um, department um, and as they have the rollout of scholars returning, um, the assumptions around their modeling on costing is also changing um, and it is also still fluid um, at this stage. So this is the initial response in the school's environment. When we then look at in terms of our, PP, our PPE, in terms of support to old age homes and ECDs, as the minister also indicated, that's a value in 12.9 million. Our initial response regarding business and economic support is about 14 million rand. And then when we look at in within communities and what we are doing there for COVID-19. So first of all, in terms of our certain areas, we they called in terms of hotspot areas and a hotspot strategy around coordination around that is around 27 million rand. In terms of our neighborhood, hot, um, neighborhood watches and in making sure that they even more operationalized in these hotspot areas, is also a value of 6,8 million rand. And overall, this is underpinned by a communication strategy that is also part of combating um, this um, pandemic that is value um, at 30 million rand. When we look at the following priorities in further going further, these are some of the impacts that COVID-19 then has have on us as a government. And so within human settlements, we have in terms of increase in property costs, and this is mainly where the municipalities are concerned, where we were in terms of um, looking at, um, well, we have increased costs in our municipal services and our rates, as well as some security regarding our projects, um, our human settlement projects um, that was ongoing during um, COVID-19 and especially in the lockdown period. Then when we look at in terms of the impact that COVID-19 has had in, in terms of our road infrastructure and years in terms of, and I must stress, it is an estimated cost on the impact that it has on contractual liabilities um, by contractors in the road infrastructure environment. And then also in terms of within the transport services, we have an estimated impact of what lockdown regulations um, cost us in terms of those, the transport service um, industry as well. Then we need to respond as a government um, with in terms of technology, that has been the most important um, and the probably the most groundbreaking um, uh, for us in terms of being able to respond, not only in the health sector, but for us in order to continue as a government to make to make sure that we deliver the service, the service um, that the citizen requires. There we needed some IC, ICT response. And then overall, this is now looking at our non-health or non-frontline uh, departments. We also have the departments, um, the rest of the departments that need to respond to COVID-19 um, regarding different kind of increased costs now. This is now around data um, because it's it's our new way of being, it's our new way of communicating, it's our new way of working. Um, and then also in terms of to ensure that the uh, different departments keep their staff stay safe um, in terms of um, going forward in terms of the service delivery. So overall, that makes up the 3 billion rand coming then from the reserves coming from our cost containment exercise and reprioritization exercise we undertook, then from the national conditional grants, and finally from unspent funding, rollover and revenue retention of the previous year. That makes up our 3, million, 3 billion rand response in this adjustments estimate. Next slide. So the impact very quickly. So number one, to stress, we have not abandoned our provincial priorities that we have uh, tabled in our uh, in the main 2020 budget in March. Um, that still continues 
Uh, and so this adjustment estimate does not um, alter that. Secondly, we need to be reminded it is a multi-phased approach. So this is our initial response um, for, for to, um, to uh, COVID-19. It's also a technical adjustment, and it's there in terms of to ensure that our resources is reprioritized with our frontline response. Then also, um, in terms of this, the first adjustments, while it is a technical adjustment, the second one will then, the second adjustments estimate or our second phase in our 2020 review, then we'll start looking and reviewing the policy shifts, like I indicated. Those, the allocations that are indicated, the 3 billion rand, that amounts to about 4% 4, 4 of um, our budget, which includes our additional adjustments that um, the House will be voting on to the value of 1.1 billion rand um, to, the main, to the main budget. The impact then of this adjustments budget in terms of our economic classification and what we see coming through is that in terms of the COE, there's an increase in COE in the health, as we would expect as part of us in terms of responding, um, in terms of saving lives, and then in terms of all other departments, we then re-looked at the planned COE budget going forward and we've asked departments to reprioritize and to only identify critical uh, vacancies going forward. Then regarding our, uh, the rest of the economic classification from the table below, you will see that we have reductions on our transfers and subsidies, and it's mainly because of our conditional grant reductions. And then on our capital spend, there is capital spending delays at this stage um, in this adjustments budget. Going forward um, in the next slide, um, then we are looking at the actual allocations. So here in this action, the actual allocations, this what represents is what the House will actually vote on. It is the net effect of, of all our allocations that we're making. So it's a net effect of the reductions of conditional grants. It's a net effect that we've reduced budgets of, of especially in, uh, reduced budgets in terms of our cost containment exercise. Um, and then it also shows you the increases in our frontline departments um, regarding communication in the Department of the Premier, our health response by the one commerce billion you see health in terms of our humanitarian relief in terms of social development, you see the 7.9 mil million rand increase. And then you see also the increase in transport and public work, which essentially is our UNI response and our local government, which is the coordination of our hotspot strategy response, you'll see an increase of 32 million rand. So the net effect is 1.1 billion rand, but our total allocations in this adjustments budget is just over 3 billion rand. Next slide. And so this slide in terms of indicates you in terms of how we are financing and where does the funding then come from in terms of those allocations. So as I indicated, we are the conditional grants is a reduction. And so all, of the, all grants, um, which are non-health grants, have been reduced. That total reduction amounts to about 665 million rand for all other non-conditional grants, um, non-health conditional grants. When we look at um, the health um, department itself, there, there is an, a new component. It's a COVID-19 component in our HIV, TB, malaria and community outreach grant. That amounts to 552 million rand. And then at the very end of this financial, of sorry, of the previous financial year, we received from the Provincial Disease Disaster Relief Grant, we received 53 million towards COVID-19. This adjustments budget now appropriates that 53 million to the Department of Health. So our net effect on our conditional grants is a reduction of 59 million um, when we take into consideration the funding or the cash we received in the previous financial year. The negative that you see there, the negative 1,2 billion rand, as I indicated before, as part of our of responding to COVID-19, we took into account as part of our savings and cost containment exercise, we took into account the impact that lockdown has had on all the departments. Also then cost containment within this government, we've gone even further than we, we, when we ended up um, in terms of when we tabled our main budget on the 10th of March. So here we looked at special items that has impacted on cost containment, 
around this pandemic. That's our traveling costs. Um, those are our catering costs. We looked at our consumable costs because no longer were we in the office. We were printing as much as before, for example. So all those consumable items we looked at in terms of savings um, for, for in order to reproductize towards COVID-19. So all in all, what we have then been able to accumulate through that exercise was 1,2 billion rand, which then gave us the fiscal room then to have allocations of 1 billion rand um, towards COVID-19 from that 1,2 billion rand that, um, that is above the, the billion rand you see. Then in terms of our emergency uh, funds from our reserves. So when we tabled our 2020 main budget, our total reserves, as the minister has indicated in his speech, was just shy of 1,8 billion rand. In this adjustments budget, we are now accessing and allocating a total of 1,4 billion rand from those reserves. Then, as I indicated also before, in our terms of our previous year unspent funds, this is our rollover revenue retention, of the previous financial year, there is about 27 million rand that we have taken into account for COVID-19. And um, all the unspent funds that is left over from the previous financial year, that will be part of the second phase in our second adjustments budget that we will take into account there. So the net effect then of those reductions and those allocations then amounts to the 1.3 billion rand that the House will vote on, but our actual allocations again is 3 billion rand. So if you add up all the neg all the positives in terms of the 552 million, the 53 million that we are allocating towards health, the 1 billion that we are we have allocating through reprioritization, the 1.4 billion from our emergency, the 27 million rand from previous year funds makes up those allocations of 3 billion rand. To note from the slide as well is that our equitable share has not been amended by national. That does then indicate to you that we did not receive any funding on our equitable share. Um, when the when um, the president announced the 500 billion rand uh, response package to COVID-19, um, there was a health component identified to the value of 20 billion rand. The decision then. Um, at the Budget Council in terms of the final decision making on the national uh, and the macro fiscal framework was that the 20 billion then would be um, would be reprioritized by provinces and not be um, uh, added to the um, added or deducted from the equitable share. So therefore our equitable share was not um, was not amended. The next slide. Um, this slide is, is quite busy. But if you look in terms of the, the middle column here, is this is your slide on conditional grants. And it's indicating to you the, the detail in terms of on actual on each grant, what those reductions are. So you'll see negatives on all the grants um, um, across the board, with the exception of the health, which you'll see the, the, the addition of 552 uh, million rand for COVID-19. Next slide. So as I indicated in terms of the reserves that we've accessed, um, this slide then indicates to you in terms of what is left from those reserves. So when we started the, the this financial year, we had reserves available um, of about 1,793 billion rand, um, just shy of the 1.8 billion rand. In this adjustments budget, we now allocate 1.4 billion rand of that 1,8 billion rand leaving us with a surplus still of 375 million rand. Then also, as I indicated, through our cost containment exercise, we then were able then to reduce our budgets by 1.2 billion rand, and we've then allocated the 1 billion rand from that 1.2 billion, which leaves us then still with a surplus from that uh, fiscal room exercise of 200 and 272 million rand. So for surpluses on our reserves, then after this adjustments budget, what we then still have remaining is 647 million rand. What we do need to indicate that this is a first phase. We are not out of the woods and therefore we do have still pressures uh, that we need to face besides the uncertain um, fiscal 
um, the fiscal outlook, not only for this financial year, but also for the entire 20 MTF um, that is still to come. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, is that the end of the presentation then? Uh, Mr. Savage, you must just remember to unmute yourself. Famous line for 2020. Mr. Savage, you unmuted yourself and then you muted yourself again. OK, you're unmuted now. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, Chairperson. The, um, sorry, sorry for that. I'm, I'm multitasking and uh, learning as I go along. The, um, I think uh, um, Annalise had, had ended up with a, a very important uh, point on budget, uh, uh, on budget pressures that we are still uh, um, having to address going forward, and I think that we will position to do in our multi-phase budget process. Um, the considerations that we are taking into account uh, uh, respond to some of the risks that we talked to earlier, clearly foremost in our minds uh, in managing uh, the, 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 the budget for the province is that this is an evolving pandemic. Uh, we don't know exactly where we stand in it. Uh, at the moment, there may be glimmers of hope, but it certainly is dark times. There is a potential of a second wave. There is, a, there, there, there is importance of resuming some of our other health services that have had, had to be deprioritized or de-escalated. And these are going to have these all could have potential costs that we are unable to completely forecast as yet, but that we, we, we must remain aware of. Secondly, there is uh, uh, ongoing impacts on uh, the collection of our own revenues. They're not very significant uh, in the provincial government, as honorable members will know. Uh, we have forecasted under collection of about 720 million rand. We need to continually review those forecasts uh, because they are obviously highly sensitive to uh, the nature of the lockdown and uh, its impacts on economic um, activity in sectors where we collect revenues uh, from. The, uh, the, there is continued uncertainty in the education se sector. We still need to determine our full costing and we Apologies, definitely- Apologies, Mr. Will. Savage. Um, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to ask members just to keep their mics off when other persons are on the floor. Um, otherwise, we hear background noise. Thank you. Mr. Savage, you may go ahead. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, <clears throat> I think we'd mentioned there is the continued uncertainty over the financing needs on, in the education sector. We are working with the Department of Education on a regular basis now uh, in, in terms of refining, uh, refining the cost pressures, and we are uh, committed to responding to those as part of the second adjustments uh, budget. Our quarantine and isolation uh, um, uh, cost pressures uh, have been subject to detailed and ongoing work in this regard. Members will notice that it's not fully financed at this point, but I would point out that it's not underfinanced in the sense that what we have to watch very closely uh, is the take up rate of quarantine and isolation facilities. So while we're trying to drive from a provincial uh, uh, health department perspective, drive take up of quarantine and isolation, we are quarantine and isolation uh, facilities are not yet fully mobilized. So that uh, it, 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 it's not yet clear that we will need the full amount of financing to be allocated there at this point, and we would not want to sterilize uh, money there uh, if we can use it productively as part of the uh, other aspects of the response. And then I think very importantly, the second phase of the, of the budget process and the third phase beyond are about how we recover uh, as, uh, as a society uh, in the province, as an economy, uh, and how our services uh, recover, um, and that will need to be taken into account in, a, in adapting to the new normal uh, of uh, of a uh, post pandemic uh, post pandemic world. There are a number of priorities in governance, in infrastructure development, in data and technology space, and we've looked at those priorities earlier. Those discussions are on uh, are, are already underway quite extensively within the provincial government that are going to position us 
to respond in the second phase of uh, of this of this budget process. And as a result, uh, we are we are doubling down on complementary measures in this budget that will make sure that we are uh, directing resources to where they are most needed at the right point in time. So the cost containment uh, expenditure management exercises that we are undertaking are not just in terms of the allocative process in the budget, but they're these complementary measures around entrenching fiscal discipline and 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 accelerating our efforts uh, at supply chain reform uh, that that aim to. Uh, um, introduce ever greater efficiencies in our in our supply chain uh, management strategies in the province. I'd like to ask just finally um, uh, DDG Jalinda Gantana to just speak to what we're doing in the provincial public entity space and what we're doing with accelerating our supply chain uh, reform uh, space as well. Okay, good afternoon chair and thank you HOD and good afternoon members. Uh, Minister, um, just to, to, to reiterate, I think what the HOD has indicated, good governance always provides and, and provides the foundation of all government activities, processes um, and initiatives. Um, and it's important that um, we maintain this good governance um, uh, uh, mantra and we support it and we, and we strengthen it. Um, as we navigate our way through not only the pandemic but also through this cut the current fine, um, fiscal fiscal crisis as as the previous speakers have already alluded to um, and it's then also expected that given our current spending um, that there's uh, that these that the spending then would be subject to um, scrutiny um, to ensure that our uh, the taxpayers' money is spent in the most efficient, effective manner, and that we do um, get um, the value for money out of it. So with that, I think just um, in terms of what was already indicated, um, all our initiatives within the Treasury is, is gearing towards entrenching a culture of good governance. But in pur for purposes of this and what we're trying to do within the phase approach, the first is to ensure that also um, that from a public entity's uh, point of view, we will be embarking on a, a review process. It will not be the first time we're doing this. We did this in 2010 uh, as well as in 2016. Um, and the aim is that we do a, a, another public entity's review just to entrench um, the principles of good governance not only within um, the public entities, but also to ensure that there's greater um, oversight um, between the uh, parent department as well as the public entity. So um, these reviews, I think Minister's already spoken to this, the HOD has spoken about this, um, um, will be uh, firstly, the first phase of it, will be a, a legal review process and then the provincial treasury will, will look at the, the, the governance arrangements. Um, in addition to that, we will also issue and update the guidelines for accounting officers to just strengthen the oversight between um, the what we term the parent department and, and the entity. Um, and then on the supply chain, um, what we are looking at, and, and, and as I've indicated, there's enhanced um, scrutiny in terms of what we're doing. Um, so uh, the provincial, the Western Cape government um, promotes a strategic sourcing approach to procurement. And we have over time sought to progressively strengthen our supply chain management systems and practices in line with, with the constitution. Um, members will uh, recall that minister in his speech made, made uh, reference to the disclosure framework. Um, and the fact that the disclosure framework, um, we will publish that uh, um, monthly. Um, and it will highlight the issues around uh, our, our expenditure on PPP purchases and expenditure, the, the, the suppliers that we are, um, that uh, is, that we we making use of in, in, in terms of this, um, as well as uh, publishing uh, cost comparisons with the average pricing of, 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 of PPE. Um, Chair, 
I'm going to ask uh, Isaac Smith if he's got anything else that he would like to add at this point in time. Thank you, Ms. Quintana. If we can just keep it very short, because members would also like to ask questions before um, the families put all their kids down for the school night bedtime as well. Understood, Chair. Um, maybe we should, uh, with your permission, Chair, then just uh, le leave it there. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, I, because I think that that does largely conclude our presentation, and that we can then we can then pick up uh, any questions that members may have um, in uh, beyond this. No problem. Um, thank you so much, members. Um, I'm recognizing hands for questions and answers now. I see Honorable McKenzie and Honorable Philander have put up their hands. I'll take the first three hands and then third was Honorable Makamba Bocha. OK, I'm going to take questions in that order and then I'll take another round after answers of those. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Can I go? Yes, you may go ahead. And is it just two or three questions? Just give some guidance, please. Um, let's try to keep our questions summarized and short, um, but um, I'm not going to stop you if context is important. I just don't want okay. members to do essays before their questions. <laughs> okay, I'll do it short. I'll leave the essays for the committees. Chairperson, I just wanted to, just looking at slides 21, and I'm going to start at the back, and I must say a thank you to the department. If you look at all the considerations, revenue under collection, um, quarantine and isolation, not fully financed. We know where we are uh, in terms of education. I think we're an hour and 25 minutes away from another big announcement on education. So I know it's extremely difficult to budget under these uncertain times. I really want to thank the, 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 the Department of the Treasury for dealing with these matters. Now, the, the, the more in detail we'll get to the committees. But I just want to first, the, the minister in his announcement today, uh, uh, made mention of the disclosure report. Uh, and I just want to understand the technical details, how that will be done. Will that be done on the website? Will it be sent to committees, to the different committees? Will it specifically go to the budget committees so that people or individuals can access this information, obviously for accountability purposes? And then my next question would be around the um, reserves and i think that slide number should i go up to my note where if we take uh, uh, i think the exact amount is 1.1 billion if i'm not mistaken and let's just make sure chairperson i'm right What position? Exact okay. amount. Go ahead. Okay. What position does it leave the Western Cape? Because we know obviously where we're supposed to get that money from, and the promises that were made and money is not coming. Going forward, should the second peak hit us, and if we are going into early next year, where are we going to find the funding from? If we're already taking funding from some important departments to deal with these frontline services. And then the last question, perhaps, uh, uh, to the minister and to the S, uh, to the uh, uh, HOD, a lot of the money is being spent on goods and services. Uh, and I'm just worried if we look at infrastructure spending, how do we find the balance going forward? Because goods and services is, in my personal opinion, more temporary than infrastructure that is more permanent and can fuel the economy. How was that thinking? Uh, brought into trying to balance the current situation and what are we going to do going forward? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Philander. Um, thank you, Chair. I think it was on slide 14 where the department made mention of the, the pressures there. Um, they made mention of an amount to medical staff. Just clarity on is it nurses, doctors, or a combination thereof, Chairperson? And then also um, in terms of the necessary cuts that had to be made, um, what criteria did the department use um, to, to cut from certain budgets, um, Chairperson, since there are no national framework or guidelines 
for reprioritization in provinces. Exactly how did they go about, Chairperson? And also the department made mention of the Q&I facilities not fully financed. Um, one can understand as they explained by the take-up rate, um, just um, clarity on that it is um, fully budgeted for should the need arise. Thank you, Chair. No problem. Thank you, Honorable Makamba Bocha. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and thanks to the presenters. Um, I just want to, I'm not sure which slide was it, but it's a slide where it reflected all the reductions that have taken place. So I just want to find out what was the rationale behind reducing human settlement budget of which uh, it should have been uh, it should have been given a, a high priority in terms of injecting more funding on it, like for an example in, on the issues of building hospitals that we currently have a huge need in this current pandemic of the COVID-19 and also looking at building the houses for the needy. The reality is that the, the people that are, and there's a lot of people that have lost jobs because of the COVID-19 who are unable to, 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 to meet up with their financial obligations, like paying their rents. Hence, we now see a lot of uh, land occupation that is taking place on the unused land. For an example, the issue of sanitation and water that has not been taken into account. In example, in, in former settlement, we have a, a shortage of water. There's no sanitation there, of which with the current situation that we're in, those people need to, 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 to use water and sanitation more frequently to keep the spread. So I just want to know what was the rationale behind that? Um, was this looked at a shorter time or what, what, was the, what was the reason for this? Because for an example, I see there's also a reduction done in education of which there is no problem. The monies from education should have been diverted to other uh, departments like the, the issue of human segment because there's nothing essential about education in this current uh, uh, challenge that we are having of COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister and HOD. I'll trust that you will direct who will be answering the questions. After that, I'll take another round. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I'll hand over to the department to answer the questions. Thank you, uh, Chairperson, and thank you, Minister. Um, and thanks, Honourable Members, for the questions. Um, uh, Honourable Mackenzie, the disclosure uh, report, the procurement disclosure report we are um, planning to launch on Tuesday, this is predominantly a web-focused, uh, public-facing uh, report. Uh, so it's an added level of transparency into our supply chains. We uh, already report on request to the um, uh, to, to the uh, the legislature, various committees and so forth. And so we have been providing information uh, as, and, as and when requested. What we're looking to do here is to standardize it. It's an innovation for us. So we are, it's a it's a, uh, a, a first step in, in, and we're aiming to incrementally expand and improve it. I think you've added some very good ideas to that on how we could make that, uh, how we could make uh, information available to the committees on a regular basis to assist them in their oversight roles, and we can we can certainly consider that uh, on a standardised uh, on a standardised basis. But the but what we're wanting to avoid in our public facing disclosure is to overload the public with a huge amount of technical detail rather than just getting to the point of what people uh, would like to would like to know in terms of how their money is being spent, uh, particularly around uh, PPE. So that's a, this is the first step. In that uh, in that process, um, the with respect to uh, the reserves, you asked, is the residual reserve um, enough? Uh, well, that you you will no notice that we we have set aside funding, both uh, both money that we had uh, taken back to the revenue fund and reserves that we had not deployed uh, in order to position us for part of our second phase of of the of the response here. But it, but it's really the policy led repro prioritization in phase two of the budget process and then into the medium term that is where we are, we are going to need to find those resources in other words we did not want in this budget process to do a set of uncalibrated cuts 
to um, uh, to our expend to to departments. Uh, they, they were negotiated very closely with the departments in terms of what was uh, what what would assist in keeping uh, core services uh, running. We but we still obviously have a way to go in phase two and phase three of the budget process. I think what it does is it underlines the importance of taking the multi-phased approach that we that we have done, and it puts us in a good position going into that phase. Um, we do believe uh, strongly that the, the provincial government remains fiscally sustainable. I think once you've had a long history of good uh, good financial governance, you you uh, go you go into these storms uh, with quite a bit of fiscal resilience, and that's what we're doing here. Um, but it doesn't mean we don't have a fiscal mountain to climb, as the as the minister had mentioned in his uh, in his speech. I uh, I would completely agree with you on the question of infrastructure spending, which is a critical part of the broader recovery that we want to take up in the second and third phases of the of the budget process at the moment the reductions that you uh, that you're seeing in uh, infrastructure spending are really due to delays caused by uh, uh, the initial lockdown and subsequent measures that mean that in the view of project managers, the, the projects are not going to be able to spend that money in this financial year. So it's really lockdown related delays uh, that of money that would not be spent any uh, any uh, anyway uh, that is being being used here rather than any deeper um, cuts. Alongside that, of course, we're also dealing with grant cuts uh, in the infrastructure um, in, the, in, in infrastructure grants um, as well. The uh, in terms of reviewing uh, the, that infra the infrastructure programs, that is something that, of course, animates us uh, in the in the provincial treasury and across our infrastructure departments in the government. Uh, and um, and work is underway in that respect uh, already to look at how we position infrastructure at, at, at the centre of the of the recovery. What is clear at that point uh, at this point is that we are going to have to look at alternative financing mechanisms for infrastructure, and so that. There's quite a bit of work um, to, to, to be done in that respect. One of the key points that has been made by our infrastructure departments is that we need to continually refine our infrastructure investment portfolio so that we're looking at, at uh, projects that are not just shovel ready, but projects that are shovel worthy as well in terms of generating the development outcomes that we want from them. Uh, Honourable Philander, you asked about the. You asked firstly about uh, additional medical staffing. Um, I think that the details the Department of Health will be able to provide in this the specific details, but it is indeed a mixture of doctors and nurses. Uh, it's the full medical uh, component that is required to activate additional field hospitals and to stabilise uh, service delivery uh, in this environment at existing uh, hospitals as well. There have been higher infection rates among medical personnel. They need for uh, uh, supplementary uh, uh, workers in that uh, respect uh, as well. In terms of how the cuts uh, were made, uh, I alluded to this. Uh, alluded to this earlier that we have tried. We have sought, as we as we articulated in the budget principles, to avo to avoid a situation of uncalibrated cuts. So there were really two parts to this. We were saying we're going to find cost containment measures where we can forego expenditure items uh, that are that are um, not uh, absolute priorities for us at the moment, but that will not impact on overall provincial strategic priorities and service delivery mandates and we will find savings we'll find savings from the lockdown uh, as, as well um, uh, that emerge from delays or the suspension of travel uh, and so forth and so that's what constitutes the savings managed to generate um, that you asked finally uh, oh, I'm sorry to just to add to that point I think when it comes to uh, um, uh, uh, the, the process of, of baseline reductions to departments we worked the provincial treasury teams worked with the departments uh, we had uh, we had technical budget engagements uh, and so we went through a very rapid fire and intensive process but a very uh, uh, interactive process with departments in finding uh, the best possible ways to 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 manage it. It's it's very difficult to generate just um, 
uh, overall national guidelines. Every every vote, every sector has its own specific characteristics that it's trying to respond to. And we wanted as a provincial treasury to understand that as best we could. So we make sure that we are not uh, doing damage to the core mandates uh, and service delivery imperatives of departments. And we believe that we have uh, managed to achieve that. The, you asked finally a question around uh, quarantine and isolation facilities uh, and, and the take-up rates. Of course, we stand ready to escalate uh, the uh, quarantine and isolation facilities as take up, uh, if take-up escalates, uh, and that is something that we can address if needed through uh, emergency expenditure authorizations, drawing on our reserves, uh, or in the second adjustments budget. Um, although we've been put, I should add that the Department of Health has been putting considerable effort into mobilization and Q&I, but there are quite high levels of uh, um, uh, uh, not dissatisfaction with the facilities because they're actually pretty nice facilities, but uh, um, hesitancy on the part of, communi uh, of communities to actually use those, uh, those those facilities, particularly for the periods that are that are required. Um, and so that remains an overall challenge for the province. And I think uh, Dr. Clouty, the head of the uh, head of our health department, has spoken at length on that issue in the past uh, as well. And there is a detailed strategy in that regard. But from the provincial treasury perspective, yes, we remain uh, we remain ready to respond as the need arises. Um, Honorable Botia, you asked the question around the Depart uh, Department of Human Settlements reductions, and you made a few few points around that. The the de the Department of Human Settlements is uh, almost predominantly funded by uh, uh, national government through a conditional grant, and that's been severely cut. Uh, over 220 million rand taken off that that grant. I should point out though that this funds and this vote, this department funds the public housing programs uh, in the main, um, obviously with a view to generating integrated human settlement outcomes. But the but hospitals uh, and clinics those are those are those are found within uh, the votes of other departments, the Department of Health, um, sanitation and water, a uh, critical part of course of of, of um, uh, livable human settlements. Uh, that that is uh, a local government function. It is funded directly by national government to local governments, and, nas and national government did make additional allocations in the local government equitable share to support municipalities themselves in that rollout. So we obviously do not appropriate it in the provincial government. Uh, 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 budget. Um, I think that there's probably a debate that can be had on uh, on the importance of responding in the education sector. Unfortunately, we're in a position where all sectors are facing extreme cost pressures, and we're trying to create a balanced and sequenced response to those pressures. And this, this adjustments budget focused very much on securing um, our, our frontline public health response and supporting our frontline uh, uh, public health workers uh, in the in the fantastic job that they're doing. Thank, um, you, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Savage. I'm going to take another two questions, members, as I would like the different families, those with families, to be able to to meet their eight o'clock school time bedtime as well. Um, Honourable Mvimbi, and then Honourable Mackenzie. Thanks very much, Person. Uh, I think uh, some of my issues were a little bit uh, explained uh, with the previous uh, questions that were asked by members. But then, uh, especially on the issue of the the recovery plan, and uh, so far as the issues of infrastructure development are concerned, now. What uh, the way I understand it now, so this has just been the reprioritization. I think the actual recovery plan, in the true sense of the word, to me, I will say it's still going to kick in, maybe on the next cycle of the budget, or as I think as the as the HOD has indicated that maybe some of those issues, because of their nature, won't be able to be expedited on this uh, financial year. So in a way that the actual recovery then is still going to come because why I say that if we look at 
what we did, I must also uh, appreciate the effort that has been made by the government to at least make available 1 billion rand towards uh, addressing this challenge because it's not an easy, it's not an easy decision just to make one, one, bo 1 billion for this. But in spite of that, I think there still remain many challenges. Like if I look at the slides, some of the money, most of the money goes to the to the Department of Health, about 1.8 billion. If I look at uh, slide uh, 15, of and then they, of that there will also be about 400 million that is going to be for for quarantine and isolation sites. That's maybe my question will be related to what uh, Honorable Mboja has asked. But because quarantine and isolation facilities are different from shelters where we have to address the issues of de-densification in the area. Has there been no allocation for such or is it also going to be looked into into the human settlement? If, they, if I can just maybe have a, a, a comment on that as to whether has there the issue of de-densification and allocation for de-densification been catered into this um, budget. I think also part what I will see as a recovery plan will be when we are starting to make effective inroads into the, because our recovery should also be about the re restructuring of the economy and also transforming the economy. For example, a substantial amount of money, close to 320, just over 320 million will be used, if I get it correctly, for PPEs. It will be interesting maybe to check whether those PPE, are they being bought uh, from or are they being imported? Uh, is this important or are they being manufactured locally? Or do we allow that space for them to be allocated locally? That's when I will say that we are actually beginning to make meaningful impact into the reconstruction as well as the restructuring of the economy. Now, I will also want to check if I can maybe be answering that as to whether this PPE, the more than 300 million that we are using for PPE, are they being sourced out from the private sector or are they being imported? or where are we actually getting them? Or are we, do we, are we making any means to make sure that we try and make sure that the people that are actually on the small and micro-medium enterprises are also benefiting from this? I also want to check, there is also somewhere, something called Solidarity Fund. At what stage do we also try and put some of the allocation that might come from Solidarity Fund or has this budget also taken into consideration some of the money that might be coming from the, the Solidarity Fund? Lastly, Chairperson, of course, when it comes to numbers, it can be very, very confusing. I know the minister, when he started talking, he was talking about, about an amount of 3 billion rand that is meant for reprioritization of which 1 billion of that is coming from the reserves, if I can just clarify that. And then the rest of the other, which is about 2 billion rand, where are we actually getting that, that from? I'm going Thank to stop you. the chairperson. Okay. Those are your questions, Honorable Mvimbi? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, Chairperson. No problem. Thank you so much. Um, Honorable McKenzie has indicated to me um, that his hand was up from previously. Um, so, Minister and HOD, that's then the last of the questions. I yeah, will that's... keep mine for the respective. Oh, Honorable McKenzie? Sorry, I just one question. Sorry, because you record mine be so I thought I'll keep oh, okay, no problem. Okay. okay, just quickly, just quickly, before we need to feed ourselves. <laughs> we, we want to appreciate, obviously, the 14 million that was given to economic development and tourism, but we have seen the restaurants are, are, are battling. Uh, our tourist agencies are battling. We've seen the flip-flopping, the, 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 the bad information from Twitter accounts from national government. Tourism is open, then it's not open for leisure. What other support, and during this 
adjustment process. Obviously, health, education, those are important sectors, but one should not forget the employment of people are also key. Except, I mean, is this 14 million, right? Because it's, I mean, in the minister's speech, he says going to workplace safety, screening passages at George. Is there enough to assist many of our small businesses that are battling? Uh, or is there consideration going forward in the next phase to look at what else one can do? Because we're on our own at the moment. So we need to do with the, whatever we've got to try and save some of these businesses. So what is the plan going forward from Treasury to look at how we can assist many of these small businesses, which are inevitably going to lead to many job losses in the future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Minister HOD, I will leave it to you to answer. I'm just going to ask that the members just um, mute themselves again afterwards and lower their hands. And then after those two questions, um, we're going to wrap things up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Um, I'll hand over to the uh, HOD to respond, but I do want to pick up on the last uh, question by the Honourable Mackenzie. Uh, yes, there is an allocation uh, to uh, the Department of Economic Development and Tourism, uh, as you rightly point out, 14 million rand, and that will go some way uh, to assisting small businesses, including uh, in the, the tourism uh, uh, environment and subsectors uh, within that environment, including uh, the hospitality uh, industry. But I think ultimately the, the, the solution uh, lies not so much in uh, an allocation, uh, but in the department working hard uh, to persuade national government that in fact the regulations uh, need to be amended so that ultimately we can start to open up the sector but to, do, uh, but to open it up in a way that uh, is safe in the Western Cape. Uh, HOD? Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chairperson and, and members for the questions. Uh, Honourable Mvimbi, with respect to the, uh, the allocations where the funding is, is, is coming from, I think on slide 20, we tried to lay out, uh, and um, and my colleague at least Pick spoke to it in, in in a little bit of detail, the the uh, as to where we had sourced the financing from. Now there is uh, the, it has been sourced from the reserves, 1.4 billion rand that we're drawing down from the the reserves that we had uh, set aside for this year, the um, and uh, and from reprioritizations across the votes of the provincial government. So the total amount, once one nets out reprioritization and the drawing of the reserves is an additional 3.056 billion rand that's pushed to the frontline response that's part of this uh, adjustments budget. The net effect of that in terms of what the, uh, what the legislature has asked to appropriate is uh, in addition is 1.1 uh, billion rand, but the total quantum of re resources that are being repositioned, reprioritized here, is uh, is uh, is that 3.056 uh, billion rand. The um, with respect to uh, de-densification and human settlements, I think I should. They, they, I do know that there is a extended debate that is underway, uh, or, or extensive development of a strategy rather that is underway in the department. Department of Human Settlements in that respect on the de-densification approach that is already funded in part through our informal settlement upgrading programs for which funding remains available uh, within uh, the grants received uh, by the by the department. So they would be able to, I think, provide more um, detailed uh, insight into the specific de-densification strategies that are being being followed. Suffice to say that obviously de-densification is not something that can happen overnight. Uh, it, it's uh, got uh, infrastructure implications and, uh, and, and so forth. So as an immediate public health response, uh, it is uh, uh, it, it is not as effective as some other measures uh, that uh, it, that are that are at the core of the of the hotspot strategy of the province um, are. With respect to uh, P 
PPE, uh, a very important question in that regard. That yes, there's significant uh, resources that are being um, that are being allocated here to uh, personal protective equipment. Those are when they come to uh, when when they come through government supply chain systems, are um, procured in a regulated environment. Part of that regulation is a local content requirement, 100% local content requirement, for example, for cloth cloth masks. Uh, and of course, as a provincial treasury team, we work with all of our um, uh, all of our departments to ensure compliance with those requirements. There are other requirements that are placed as well in terms of um, uh, maximum uh, price benchmarks uh, and so, so forth. This has been a rapidly changing terrain. So what we did very early as a provincial treasury was work with the Department of Economic Development and Tourism to establish a supplier database that would uh, ensure that Western Cape businesses were able to access our, 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 our um, supply chain systems and, and become suppliers to, uh, to us as quickly um, and, and, and as effectively and compliantly uh, as possible. The, so um, we, we are not yet in a position to analyze the full impact of that. Obviously, this is uh, uh, um, still in motion, um, but one of the things we're wanting to do by, uh, um, in, uh, by through the public disclosure uh, framework is to say, well, who are these suppliers? Are they local companies and so forth? But also to encourage other suppliers to join our platforms as a Western Cape government, uh, particularly Western Cape suppliers uh, and small businesses. One other uh, uh, development that's underway that uh, has been subsequent actually to the large, to, to the majority of the finalization of this budget is in respect of our hotspot strategies. And that is looking uh, at uh, in in some in some hotspots is looking at uh, uh, partnering with SMMEs and helping them to get into cloth mask production. So it's not direct purchasing by government, but it's more support to SMMEs to be able to get to 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 initiate cloth mask production. And uh, the Health Foundation, which uh, works with the Department of Health, has launched the Ubuntu Masks uh, Initiative, which does precisely this and allows uh, um, um, SMMEs to to um, produce masks to specification. And in fact, it's just moved on to its second design modification uh, in in that respect and is scaling scaling up capacity. And that's something we're looking uh, uh, to to support. But we're not at this point looking for the Western Cape government to procure per se in that space, but rather to support the development of the market uh, in the production of, of, of uh, masks that meet the public health uh, requirements in, in, in this respect. We have been uh, finally in touch with the Solidarity Fund. Um, the Solidarity Fund is supporting us in the Western Cape. An amount of, I think, a little over 120 million rand has been provided again to the Health Foundation for um, uh, medical equipment. Um, and there have been other donations as well to the House Health Foundation of Medical Equipment that comes into our into our health uh, into our health system, um, but that is not appropriated in this budget uh, per se. There are some details where we have received donations. We're reporting on those received to date in the budget documentation. We will obviously continue to uh, to do so in that respect as well. The second area that we're in discussion with the Solidarity Fund uh, about is in terms of our broader hotspot strategy and uh, whether we can partner with the Solidarity Fund, not necessarily receive direct funding from them, but make sure their efforts and our efforts as a provincial government are aligned within our hotspots, particularly around initiatives that are associated with behavior change, social distancing, hand washing, uh, wearing of a mask, uh, and so forth. And, and so the Solidarity Fund has been working uh, quite extensively in that area. And so have we as a provincial government, and there's a there's a great opportunity for, for collaboration um, there as well. I think uh, Honorable Mackenzie's uh, point was answered by uh, Minister Mania, so I'll leave it there. Chairperson. Thank you so much. Um, and since that is the end of the questions and answers, thank you so much for the Minister, HOD and your team finance for being up so late 
possibly pass everyone's bedtimes with us in this MS team budget meeting. Um, I will now relieve you so that you can go back to the business of governance or dream about new initiatives for government of the Western Cape. Members, I'm going to ask that you please remain behind for some committee business. Um, yes, and thank you so much and good luck in your efforts in COVID. Thanks, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you to the hard work of the Provincial Treasury team. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chairperson, and again, thank you to Team uh, Finance and to the committee members. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay. Members, if you would just bear with us for another 15 minutes or so. Okay. Members, as that was the briefing from Provincial Treasury, the budget, the respective votes will now essentially be referred to the various committees, the various votes. So depending on the committee you sit on, you will be deliberating on those respective votes. And we will then after that come back to budget committee in order to deliberate our position and our view on this particular bill. Um, I'm going to now, before moving on to the minutes of that we still need to adopt, I just have um, feedback. Uh, let me just get to it quickly. Okay, so we've previously, it was on Monday, we asked questions to Provincial Treasury and, in, and we've asked them to submit it to us by um, yesterday, actually Wednesday, the 22nd, and Provincial Treasury has asked us whether they could just give us the questions that um, we asked on Monday for yesterday, if we could give them an extra week, please, to, to submit that to the committee. Members, are you happy with those? That's fine, Chairperson. That's okay. fine, Chairperson. Okay, then I will um, reply to Provincial Treasury then that we'll, we'll give them the extension for the answers. Okay, members, um, the second feedback I just wanted to give you was regarding um, the money bills procedure process. Um, it's been almost uh, a year since we've adopted a resolution in this committee regarding research, um, regarding a possible procedure for possibly for a bill, and it was then referred to rules committee. I then met with the respective um, officials um, with the chief whip and the deputy chief whip just to discuss the way forward um, based on a previous rules committee we had last week and um, the research that was completed by rules committee and budget committee is going to present be presented at rules committee um, and we'll just wait for um, the speaker um, to receive such presentation and then for, for us to get the presentation in Rules Committee. And the Rules Committee will then advise us on the way forward regarding procedure and frameworks and so on. So I just wanted to give members feedback regarding that because we haven't had a conversation um, about that um, and feedback yet. And yes, that's the only feedback I can think of. And if we can then just quickly a deal with the minutes, please. The minutes of 20 July. Chairperson. Uh, sorry, Honorable McKenzie. Uh, are you going to deal with the resolutions from the meeting? Uh, yes, I was hoping to deal with it after minutes, but okay, if members okay. feel no, we can do it now. Okay, no, okay, I'll deal with it then after the minutes. Minute. Okay. That's fine, yeah, thank you. No problem. Okay, members, 20 July 2020. Ms. Kluter, Ms. Ahmed, I saw the minutes and then it disappeared. So we can just Is maybe it, get it up gonna... again. Yes, Wasima, I thought members are going to do resolutions, but I'll flight it now. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. <laughs> thank you, no problem. Here we go. It's late, don't worry. Okay, here we go. Okay. Okay, let's deal with page one. Members, if you could just check your attendance there. You can go down a bit so the members can also just check their attendance. 
Okay. That's page one. We can go down to page two. Okay, we can go down. Okay, let's go down. So as you can see, members, those were the questions that we asked for the 22nd of July, which we're going to give Provincial Treasury an extension for then. Let's go down. Yes, and then that's the end of the minutes. Members, the, members are there a mover for the minutes? Going once. Move. Going twice. Move. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Mbimbi and Honorable Philander. The minutes are then adopted. Members, I'll open up for resolutions. Are there any resolutions, members? Yes, Chairperson. Uh, Ms. Uh, Honourable Mackenzie, but um, Ms. Ahmad, do you have something you need to alert our attention to? I see your hand is up. Oh no, I didn't know my hand is up. Sorry, Chair. Oh, okay. No, oh, my problem. hand is not up. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. No problem. Honourable Mackenzie, you can go ahead. Yes, please. Now, I just want keen to see how this website is going to look like. So if they can just send us the details as soon as it launches on Tuesday. I presume it will be separate to the normal. Web's web Western Cape government website also going to be a link. If we can just have that exact details on Tuesday, it'll be appreciated. Thank you. Is this the launch of the disclosure report, Honorable McKenzie? Yes, Chairperson. No problem. Members, are you happy with that? That we just please ask them to send us the details and the link. Thank you. Okay. Any other resolutions? Going once, going twice. Okay, members, if there are no other resolutions, thank you so much for staying up um, in the budget committee with us this evening. Um, yes, we will be together next week again. So it's, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And um, members, be safe, stay warm, and thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Meet you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.